Good afternoon. Well, AFP Greater Detroit is very excited to be a part of this. Um, the relationship between all of the organizations that represent fundraisers and, and philanthropy is very important. Uh, AFP is the largest organization representing professional fundraisers worldwide with over 31,000 members. We have 30, 346 members here in Greater Detroit. And can I just see a show of hands of everybody that is an AFP member? All right, well, that's great, but there seem to be a few hands that aren't up. So I hope that next year when we come back, we'll have a few more. Um, if you don't know about AFP, I encourage you to come to one of our events. We're, we, our focus is on professional development and education for the profession. And we do very frequent and very affordable training for local fundraisers. And we really touch on all of the different sectors. So it's a great opportunity. And we also connect all of us professionally to the Donor Bill of Rights and the Code of Ethics and fundraising. So I think it's really important that every nonprofit have at least one member of AFP. I'm really uh, pleased to introduce our, our last speaker today, Philip Chard. After 32 years as president and CEO, Philip recently retired from Empathia Inc., a behavioral services firm providing health, safety, and productivity solutions for over 400 organizations in North America. He remains a practicing psychotherapist who, for over 34 years, wrote an award-winning weekly column in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel titled, Out of My Mind. Sounds a little bit like our profession, which he continues to publish through his website. Philip is author of The Healing Earth, which won the Midwest Publishers Award, and Nature's Ways. His next book, which is a compilation of his newspaper columns, is due out later this year. Philip has been a guest expert on ABC's 2020, has presented at the Brookings Institution, and has keynoted dozens of national conferences. Previously, he was Director of Behavioral Science Education at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine, where he was an Associate Professor and received the Outstanding Faculty Award. Thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon. Come on, I'm a psychotherapist. I need more feedback or I'll get insecure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, that's great. Thank you. You're still here. I want to start out uh, this afternoon by asking you to try something that we're going to look at as a very critical element in being effective in interpersonal relationships, and that's the capacity to self-regulate, to be in charge of yourself rather than having the environment pulling your strings all the time. And the way I'm going to ask you to do that is by doing something called a brain reboot. Okay, so if you'd be kind enough to humor me, please put your feet flat on the floor. Drop whatever you, don't drop it, put down whatever you have in your hands and put those maybe on your lap. Sit up straight, but not at attention. And take, drop those shoulders down too because we all work on computers all the time and we're hunched up constantly. So drop down your shoulders if you would. And then eyes open or closed, take three or four deep breaths in this precise way. Inhale through your nose, pause briefly at the top of that breath, and then exhale fully through parted lips. So inhalation through the nose, brief pause at the top of the breath, full exhalation through parted lips. Let's do three or four of those together right now, please. Thank you. In that brief exercise, you did something we call a brain reboot. It's kind of a way to reset the central nervous system. Uh, it's not unlike what the computer people tell you when your hard drive, or excuse me, your laptop or your computer is not functioning very well. What's the first thing they tell you to do? Reboot the computer. So rebooting the brain is actually proving to be an essential skill for people who move between interaction to interaction or activity to activity because our tendency is to drag along with us whatever happened before we actually got into that interaction. So when I asked you to do that here this afternoon, it was because your heads are already full. You know, you've had a lot of conversations, you've been receiving a lot of information, 
And so I wanted you to kind of clear a little bit of the information cache, the emotional cache out of the brain so that you could be fully present here for the presentation today. I'm going to share with you a lot of information. Almost all of it is evidence-based. We have science to back this up. And it's really about how can you be the most effective at interacting with other people. So it's going to be about communication, but probably in ways that are a little bit different for some of you to experience. And so as I go through this material, you may have questions, you may have comments. Feel free to jump in with those at any time. We're not going to do separate Q&A at the, at the end. And if you want to disagree with me, I'm fine with that. Uh, when I was about 14 years old, I think it was my, my mother told me I had an oppositional disorder. I don't believe she used that term. But um, I still have a little bit of that, so if you want to have a debate, I'm fine with it. But let's jump right in. First of all, what is an interpersonal star? It's somebody who's really good at, has designed themselves around the craft, if you will, of relating effectively to other people. And that's really a big part, I think, of what you folks do in your work, is building those connections, building those relationships, and using them for mutual benefit. So here's what we know from the neuroscience and the behavioral science about what makes somebody an interpersonal star. They have, first of all, this thing called emotional intelligence, which I'm, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They also have something called a growth mindset, which we'll get into a little exercise with in a moment. They're a self-leader, meaning they have this capacity to invest in their own ability to grow and learn and become more effective in what they do. They're affiliative in their style, meaning they connect with other people and they're willing to be part of the team if, they're, if they work in a team environment as opposed to standing apart from it, delegating, giving orders, that sort of thing. And that last capacity is mindfulness. And you've heard a lot about that lately. It's a buzzword. I have the privilege to be a strategic consultant for the University of Wisconsin Center for Healthy Minds in Madison. This is a group of about 42 neuroscientists and eggheads, and mostly what they do is study the neuroscience behind well-being, meditation, mindfulness, contemplative practices, and here's one of the things they've found out that's really important to know. Emotional intelligence and interpersonal effectiveness are learnable skills. Anyone can acquire these capacities if they're willing to put themselves into it. They've also learned through this science that emotional intelligence and mindfulness are joined at the hip. You can't have one without the other, which is why at least a portion of what I'm going to share with you today is designed around that. But let's start with a question first. I'd like you to think about somebody you know who you believe was really effective as a communicator. They just did a, they were a natural, they just had this capacity to really connect with people make that interaction flow and keep it going in a productive and valuable way. If you take a moment to think about somebody like that you've either worked with, maybe they've been a mentor of yours, could be a friend, colleague, whomever, and if you would, jot down just for yourself one, two, maybe three behaviors that that person exhibited, you observed them exhibiting, that you think made them effective at what they did. What were those one or two or three behaviors, and let's focus on behaviors, that they engaged in that made them particularly effective at uh, interacting with other folks? If you take a moment to do that, please. Now, think about those behaviors and classify them according to one of three categories, if you would. Were those behaviors related specifically to business skills or business acumen, things like their ability to manage their time effectively or organize their thoughts, that sort of thing? So was it a business skill? Was it a technical skill? Were they just really good at imparting certain kinds of information to people? 
or was it an emotional intelligence skill, meaning this capacity to deal with people at an emotional and interactive level? Which one of those was it? How many of you had, as you looked at your descriptions, you would put in that EI category? Okay, the majority. I did this exercise with a, um, a construction firm out of Omaha called Kiewit Corporation. They're, they build really big things. And they put us in front of a whole group of their high potential leaders who are all engineers, and they said, you gotta teach these guys about emotional intelligence. And by the way, they think it's bunk, okay? So the first thing we did was they asked them this sort of a question to think about a leader they knew was really effective and jot down the behaviors of that leader, and then we had them come up to a board and paste it on, with Post-it notes in one of those three categories. Of course, the EI category was dripping Post-it notes. And technical skills, these are engineers, technical skills and business acumen had a few entries, but that was pretty much it. People generally understand intuitively that if you're gonna be an effective communicator, you have to have that capacity called EI. So what is it? Well, it really consists of these four primary elements. One of those is self-awareness, and by the way, that's the toughest one. This capacity to sort of hold a mirror up and watch ourselves and observe ourselves, you know, that's a tough thing to be able to develop, but it's central to emotional intelligence. If you can't be aware of your own feelings and how you're reacting to other people, then your capacity to modify that or amplify it really goes down. Then there's self-management, and there's where mindfulness really comes in. Self-management is the ability to regulate what's going on inside of you, your emotional responses to things, as opposed to having the environment regulate you by sort of jerking your emotional chain, whatever it feels like it. Social awareness, sort of a word for empathy really, is this ability to read feelings in other people and respond appropriately to those feelings. And all three of those capacities sort of come to rest, if you will, in relationship management. That's where it all comes home. So that's what EI is, and the question is, how do you get it? Well, one way that people get it is by the mindset that they bring to their work. And we know from a lot of educational research that there are real, really two primary kinds of mindsets, a growth and a fixed. And you can see from these descriptions up here that they're very different from one another. Now on your tables, you have a handout handout that's got you know some line graphs on it, a continuum graph on it, and it lists on the left those capacities that are associated with what we call a growth mindset, which is, hey, I can learn things. If I make a mistake, I learn from it, so on and so forth. And on the right, you'll see those capacities associated with what we call more of a fixed mindset. I'm kind of done learning, I know what I know, I graduated, thank you very much, and now I'm just gonna keep doing, doing, doing as I go through life. So I want you to be very candid with yourself because you're not turning this in and hopefully your neighbors won't peek, but very candid with yourself and rate where you think you are in your work life. It could be different in your home or personal life, but in your work life, rate where you think you are on that continuum by just making a mark where you think you would fall on that differentiator. And when you're done with that, I'm gonna ask you to do one other thing with this. Don't overthink it. Your subconscious is right most of the time. So when it gives you an immediate response, it's usually correct. How many of you work with a team or a set of colleagues? Would you be kind enough to raise a hand? Now would you go back to that graph, or that chart rather, and rate them on those same capacities? Where do you think they would fall on that continuum compared to you? So make a separate mark for your colleagues or your team if you would please.
So as you've probably already figured out, <clears throat> if there's some great disparities on these measures between you and the folks you work with, you have a challenge ahead of you, okay? My assumption is that you probably rated yourself higher than them on most of these scales. That's called the self-image management technique. And uh, if you did, but you're really being honest and candid with yourself and you feel like you're in a team of people who are maybe a little bit more on the fixed side than the growth side, then part of the challenge you face is to use your own emotional intelligence to mentor and role model for some of those folks. And that can be a very effective way to begin creating a little bit different team culture around this. But let's dive a little bit into this EI thing real quick. According to the Harvard Business School, these are the ratings, higher is obviously better, on emotional intelligence based on organizational hierarchy in most businesses. What did you notice about this? <laughs> it's kind of apparent, isn't it? As a former CEO, I'm here to confess, um, fundamentally what we see is that as people rise in an organization, even if it's not a big organization that has all these titles, but even within a smaller team or group, as they get into positions of power or authority, their EI goes down. Why do you suppose that is? Anybody have any idea about what makes that happen? Yes, please. Interesting, many of their decisions are more fact-driven. They kind of have their faces in the data all the time. And, and also, as you get into the C-suite, you aren't interacting with as many people as you are certainly in a line position or a supervisor or managerial position. Any other reasons you can think of? I was just gonna say they become isolated and they have gatekeepers around them. Right. And they don't get all the information. Very good, that's also true. Uh, you've all, these are both true and there's one you're missing. So I'm doing, I'm doing the p teacher bit. You know, the teacher bit is I know, I'm asking you, maybe you know. If you don't, then I can tell you and I look like I really know my stuff. Okay, yes. As a supervisor and a manager, you're walking the walk and talking the talk in the trenches. Right, so you have this day-to-day, moment-to-moment, not to mention also, you're also working with people sort of below you in the hierarchy and above you in the hierarchy, so you're sort of doing this shape-shifting kind of thing back and forth between those. Well, here's the other interesting thing. It's really all about the impact of perceived power on one sense that you have to use emotional. It's not that CEOs are inherently emotionally stupid. It's that they make choices based on this power effect and the other things that some of you mentioned that sort of give them a get out of jail free card. Oh, I don't have to use EI because I have positional power. I'm gonna show you a short video about this from a neuroscience lab at UC Berkeley where they talk about the number one challenge for people who are in power positions. And again, you don't have to be a CEO, it's just anybody in an organization that said, you're in charge of whatever can have this effect. So let's take a look-see at this real quick. So there are regions of the frontal lobes that are now being called the empathy network. And those regions of the brain do a lot of things, but what, one of the things that they do is they kind of help us detect other people's pain. When you damage the empathy networks of your brain, which some people do, they become really impulsive. And you can have people who are really good citizens of the world, right? And if they have this head trauma, and little chunks of the frontal lobes are gone, they'll start swearing suddenly, they start yelling at their kids, they feel disconnected. In the neuroscience literature, they call this acquired sociopathy. Through brain trauma, you become a sociopath. And our lab studies find, if you give people a little bit of power, they kind of look like those brain trauma patients, right? <laughs> so we find, like, if I feel powerful, I flirt inappropriately, I am more likely at work to swear and to act in a rude fashion, I'm more likely to gamble, it makes you impulsive. When you feel powerful, you kind of lose touch with other people. You stop attending carefully to what other people think. In our lab, it's come to be known as the Cookie Monster Study. We brought three people to the lab. We pointed at one person, we said, you're in charge, right? And so that person kind of felt powerful. And then they had to do this really boring task of like write policies for the university. And they're getting kind of bored. We bring a plate of chocolate chip cookies. Everybody takes one cookie. All groups always leave one cookie on the plate because you don't want to be that person that takes the last cookie. So there's that fourth cookie. And we find high power people they reach out and take it, 
And then my grad student, Dan Ward at the time, he came to me and he's like, I think people are eating differently when they have power. And lo and behold, our high power person was more likely to eat with their mouth open, lips smacking, crumbs literally like falling onto their sweaters, you know. It's ridiculous. So that's the hill you have to climb if you have power and you want to be good at emotional intelligence. I was actually giving this presentation once to a, a healthcare group and the C-suite people were sitting at the table, which was right over there at the time, and uh, I did, they were eating. It was a lunch presentation, so I'm like looking over there at this, <laughs> see who's doing the, you know. And it was true, it was happening. So uh, just be aware of the fact that if you are in a position where people either look at you as having power or you've been anointed with it in some fashion, it's a steeper hill for you to climb to demonstrate emotional intelligence. But it's worth it, there's lots of benefits. You can see them listed there for you. And primary among these is decision making. Also people who have high EI are really good at working with teams obviously as we talked about previously. They have much more effective leadership skills and are viewed by others as more effective leaders even if they don't have the title of being a leader. So EI has many benefits for you personally, but it also has great benefits for the folks you work with because they're gonna feel heard, they're gonna feel listened to and connected with you, and that's really a critical part, obviously, of what you do. So let's take a quick look at these different elements of EI one at a time and how those relate also to this idea of mindfulness. First among these, and again, as I said, very difficult one to achieve is self-awareness. And that's really the capacity to know your feelings while you're having them. A lot of us can figure it out after the fact. You know, we can come away from an interaction that may have had emotionality with it and go, oh, that's what I was feeling. But we may not have the capacity to realize, okay, somebody just pushed one of my hot buttons. I'm getting upset. I need to do something about that. That's the power of self-awareness is that capacity to know your own emotional tendencies and be able to regulate them in an effective way. Now, developing this isn't easy, and there was a study done by the folks who wrote the Emotional Intelligence QuickBook that showed that moderate to high levels of self-awareness are only present in about a third of the workforce. So you may, sometimes you may come away from an interaction with somebody and go, what was that person thinking? Did they not realize how they came across? And the answer is, nah, they didn't realize how they came across because they didn't have that capacity to reflect. And it is a difficult thing to master. One person once described it to me as uh, being self-aware or the mind, in other words, recognizing and understanding itself is a little bit like the eye trying to see itself. You know, it's, it's an instrument of consciousness, so it has to reflect back on itself and that's not an easy thing to do. So, the primary method that the neuro, excuse me, the behavioral science tells us works to develop self-awareness, there are two. And the first of those is to have a confidant. That's somebody you, who works with you or at least understands what you do, who you can go to and say, hey, I just had this gnarly interaction with somebody and I need to process it with somebody. Could you help me do that? Or if you're in a meeting, have that person be the one who watches what goes on. I was asked to do that in a leadership context where they have a lot of problems in the organization, very toxic kind of environment. They asked me to sit in on one of their managerial meetings, which I did, and just observe. So I did, and um, after the fact, I had to sit down with the leader of the team and say, gee, um, because it didn't occur to him at all what was happening, did you realize, did you notice how the dynamics in the conversation kind of collapsed when you called that guy an idiot? <laughs> and he goes, really? <laughs> okay. Okay. So self-awareness is not something you should just assume people have. You know? So if you have a confidant who can give you feedback and you're open to it, you need to be receptive then fundamentally you can learn from that person and really grow that capacity. Um, how many of you feel like you've got somebody like that who you can turn to and go, hey, what just happened in there? Did you watch me? What did I do? A fair amount. If you don't, then think about potentially being able to cultivate that. But even if that's not possible for you, there's still something you can do with it, and that's where mindfulness comes in. So back to the cookie monster who says, today me live in the moment. 
unless it's unpleasant, in which case you will eat a cookie, okay? So this is good counsel. Um, but mindful people are rare in our culture. That's why you're hearing so much about it, because it's not a common capacity for most of us because of reasons I'll share with you soon. But people who are mindful have the capacity to really elevate this self-awareness, because that's part of what it is. It's being in the moment, not being distracted about future thinking, past thinking, and therefore, when you're in the now, as they say, you really are able to be more aware of yourself as well as other people. So let's just dive into this mindfulness thing real quick. This is what it consists of. And by the way, if you're right away in your head, you're going mindfulness, meditation, same thing. No, they're not the same thing. Mindfulness, excuse me, meditation is a way to become more mindful, but it is not mindfulness per se. So it's about, again, emotional self-awareness. I know what I'm feeling as I'm feeling it. It's about the next step, which is emotional self-regulation. I'm in charge of my feelings and my actions. The environment is not. And being focused on, again, that moment, the present moment, which most of us are not the majority of the time. And that last thing, pro-social behavior. Mindful people engage in pro-social behavior, the opposite of anti-social behavior, obviously. And those behaviors are the things that fuel and generate connection. Connection at an emotional level, which is where people make decisions, okay? When I walked up here today, you looked at me, you noticed my race, my gender, and my age, pretty much in that order. Um, and then you started forming opinions about me. Those were not based on some analytic process. They were based on a gut feeling, an emotional reaction. And people who are mindful have this capacity to really create more of those positive feelings in other people. They did a study at the Center for Healthy Minds, again, where they took folks off the street, fairly large sample of just randomly <laughs> dragging people in off the street in Madison, Wisconsin, and showing them these pictures, just face, faces of people, and they actually, uh, they made the faces so that they couldn't see the hair or the ears or anything, just the, actually just the orb of the face itself. And they asked these people, can you look at these pictures and point out which of these folks are mindful and are meditators and which are not? And they were able to do it to an extremely high degree of accuracy. And part of the conclusion that came out of that study was, hey, Mindful people are projecting out something to the folks they're with that people pick up on subliminally. They're not aware of it necessarily unless they're asked. And what they're picking up is, oh, this is an emotionally safe, friendly, engaged human being. And they're just doing that by looking at their facial expressions. So I wanted to show you another quick video. This one is from Dan Harris. You know who Dan Harris is? He wrote a book called 10% Happier. He was an ABC News correspondent. And Dan Harris uh, was not somebody, if, if you knew him, I've met Dan, he's not somebody that you would uh, look at and go, this guy's a meditator. Um, he had a panic attack one, one evening giving the news, the national news. He had a panic attack on, on air, flop sweat, the whole bit. And so he went to people like me, I'm a psychotherapist, and you know we couldn't help him. And so finally somebody, uh, this is not unusual. So uh, then he went to somebody and was just talking about, and said, did you ever try meditation? No, what's that? And then he got into it and he tried it and sure enough, that gave him what he needed to be in charge of his own emotional responses. So then he became a devotee of this. And so I'm gonna show you a little video of Dan Harris talking about how he came to believe that meditation and mindfulness were an important part of being emotionally intelligent. Here we go. There's no way a fidgety and skeptical news anchor would ever have started meditating were it not for the science. The science is really compelling. It shows that uh, meditation can boost your immune system, lower your blood pressure, uh, help you uh, deal with problems ranging from irritable bowel syndrome uh, to psoriasis. And the neuroscience is where it really gets sci-fi. There was a study out of Harvard that shows that short daily doses of meditation can literally grow the gray matter in key areas of your brain having to do with self-awareness and compassion and shrink the gray matter in the area associated with stress. There was also a study out of Yale 
that looked at what's called the default mode network of the brain. It's a connected uh, series of brain regions that are active during most of our waking hours when we're doing that thing that human beings do all the time, which is obsessing about ourselves, thinking about the past, thinking about the future, doing anything but being focused on what's happening right now. Meditators not only turn off the default mode network of their brain while they're meditating, but even when they're not meditating. In other words, meditators are setting a new default mode. And what's that default mode? They're focused on what's happening right now. In sports, this is called being in the zone. It's nothing mystical, it's not magical. You're not floating off into cosmic ooze. You are just being where you are. The cliche in self-help circles is being in the now. You can use that term if you want, but it, because it's accurate, it's, it's slightly annoying, but it's accurate. I, I, it's, it's more just being focused on what you're doing. And the, the benefits of that are enormous. And this is why you're seeing these unlikely meditators now, why you're seeing the US Marines adopting it, the US Army, corporate executives from the head of Ford to the founders of Twitter, athletes from Phil Jackson uh, to uh, many, many Olympians, uh, scientists, doctors, lawyers, school children. There's this sort of elite subculture of high achievers who are adopting this because they know it can help you be more focused on what you're doing and it can stop you from being yanked around by the voice in your head. My powers of prognostication are not great. I bought a, a lot of stock in the company that made Palm Pilot back in 2000, and that didn't go so well for me. But having said that, I'm gonna make a prediction. I think we're looking at meditation as the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told people that you went running, they would say, who's chasing you? Right now, if you tell people you meditate, and I have a lot of experience with telling people this, they're gonna look at you like you're a little weird most of the time. That's gonna change. Meditation is gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like exercise, brushing your teeth, and taking the meds that your doctor prescribes to you. These are all things that if you don't do, you feel guilty about. And that is where I think we're heading with meditation because the science is so strongly suggestive that meditation can do really, really great things for your brain and for your body. The common assumption that we have, and it may be subconscious, is that our happiness really depends on external factors, how was our childhood? Have we won the lottery recently? Did we marry well? Did we marry at all? But in fact, meditation suggests that happiness is actually a skill, something you can train just the way you can train your body in the gym. It's a self-generated thing. And that's a really radical notion. It doesn't mean that external circumstances aren't going to impact your happiness. It doesn't mean you're not going to be subject to the vagaries of an impermanent entropic universe. It just means you are gonna be able to navigate this with a little bit more ease. A colleague of mine sent a picture to me the other day of the morning briefing for uh, uh, a group of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police all sitting meditating before they went out on their shift. Uh, the Madison Police Department now requires all new recruits to go through a course in mindfulness and meditation so they have better emotional self-regulation. Obviously, they face very difficult situations where their hot buttons get pushed a lot. So this is becoming much more widespread. He referenced the military. Now the Air Force is also picking this up. Apple Computer has been actually in conversations with the center in Madison about how they can embed things into their operating system to help people with the deleterious effects of too much contact with what they created, okay? Smartphones, computers, tablets, and so on and so forth. So this is getting tremendous amount of traction. But you're probably saying, oh, well, he's talking about meditating. I have to meditate. No, you don't. There are really three ways to promote mindfulness. The first is what we did when we started here today, the brain reboot or what they call a mindful moment. And that's something people do throughout the day um, that's very effective in, again, regulating their emotional response and being present with people that they interact with. The other one's called mindful habits, and that's just simply, that doesn't require any new time commitment on your part. It means taking the things you already do every day and doing them mindfully. So as opposed to brushing your teeth and thinking about what you're gonna have, you know, what the meeting's gonna be later today or washing the dishes and wondering about what you're gonna make for lunch tomorrow, you're actually brushing your teeth. Okay, you're actually washing the dishes and investing yourself mentally into that process. It may not sound that interesting, but when was the last time you actually tried it? Okay, so meditation then is the intensive form of this, and it works, and it works effectively, and it works with minimal time investment. How long do you think 
somebody would need to meditate on a daily basis before they begin to create that new default mode network in the brain that Dan Harris talked about. How much of a, uh, how long does a meditation every day, meditation session every day need to be to bring about that effect, which takes about six to eight weeks, yes? Five minutes, correct, okay? Actually, the sweet spot we call is five to 10 minutes, but uh, the science at the center uh, that I was referring to, uh, you may, may have heard of a gentleman named John Kabat-Zinn. He's a physician who tried to build a program of meditation for physicians to help them combat burnout, and he prescribed 45 minutes a day. And you can imagine what the physician community did with that. You know, so the center said, well, we don't really know. I mean, somebody just picked a number out of the air. Let's look at it. And their science shows that five to 10 minutes a day, every day, six to eight weeks, in that default mode he was talking about, begins to switch. So you're not only calmer, more self-aware, more emotionally in control while you're meditating, you're, it starts to spill out into the rest of your life. And you find yourself, you know, one of your kids will do something that used to really set you off, and you're not getting set off. You know, maybe you're still angry, but you're not reacting in a reactive, knee-jerk kind of fashion. So any of these methods will get you there. It's just that meditation tends to get you there a little quicker. Any questions about that before I move into the second phase? Most of you have done public speaking, right? You know what kind of, you look at the faces of your audience, you know, and you're always looking for, you're always on guard for a particular look, okay? And it's after lunch, it's the last presentation of the day. You know, I'm seeing a little bit of that out there, okay? And I actually call that the frogs watching lightning look, okay? Because you're like up here going, oh, you look out and the people are just. <laughs> I've actually watched frogs when they watch lightning and they don't react, okay? So that's kind of what it is. The next phase in this is self-management and mindfulness is really critical for this phase. Um, this is how to regulate your hot buttons and we all got them. Um, excellent presentations earlier today. I heard a lot of talk about values. Um, if you'll think about what your hot buttons are, I mean, what is it that really kind of sets you off and really gets you going? It's usually when somebody is pushing against, trampling, disrespecting one of your core values. That's what really triggers a hot button experience. So that's something to be aware of when you become aware of the values of the folks, the donors, and so on that you're working with. But self-management is designed to in, uh, promote something called internal locus of control. Bless you. This is an example of what psychologists do all the time, which is tell you things you already know in words you can't understand, okay? That's how they stay in business. So locus of control simply means, do you perceive at a deep level, it's usually subconscious, that the environment is in charge of your mood, your attitude, and your feelings, or do you feel like you're in charge of it? I know that'll vary based on situation and so on and so forth. But where you fall on that dichotomy is a really critical part of self-management. So here's the problem. The challenge that we all have today is mostly distractions, okay? Uh, the average office worker or information worker, which most of us are, will pick up, excuse me, we'll get 30 emails a day, or excuse me, 30 emails an hour, every hour. So if you're sitting at your computer and that's, it's dinging at you, you're like constantly being distracted. And we know that once you're distracted, it takes longer to get back on whatever the task it was than it would otherwise, okay? So technology and hyperstimulation, which are sort of peas in the same pod, create this thing called you know, neurological structure alteration. They actually change the way the brain is wired. So I was sitting with a nephew of mine, a teenager, and um, we were trying to figure out something to do and he was a little bit bored and I said, let's go out, but it was raining and he was a wuss, so we didn't wanna go out. And so I said, well, maybe we can watch something on TV. So we pulled up the TV and uh, I said, what do you wanna watch? And he goes, well, let's just surf channels and you know, we'll figure it out. So he picks up the remote, right? And he starts going, bam, 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 bam. And he makes it go, one, two, three. I can find it. I said, stop. And he goes, what? And he goes, I said, how can you tell what you want to watch? I mean, you know, you're going so fast, you can't even tell what's on. He goes, you can't see that? 
His brain was raised on technology. Mine was not, okay? I mean, when I was growing up, we had a party line, okay? That was our version of a smartphone. So, um, and it did make you smarter, by the way, because you could listen in on your neighbor's conversations. <laughs> but nonetheless, his brain has been wired to be responsive to technology in that way, and most people who are growing up today are of that kind. Uh, you got a smartphone, probably, you pick it up at least 1,500 times a week, okay? And look at it, some of you are probably looking at it now. So these kind of things distract and they modify our behavior and most adults who are saturated with technology today have functional adult, adult attention deficit disorder, okay? They are literally jumping, the mind is like jumping all over the place. We call it, the neuroscientists I should say, call it monkey mind. And it's like going to the monkey cage at the zoo at feeding time. You know, stuff's flying around, they're screaming, jumping, and that's the way thoughts tend to be when you get distracted enough. It also creates something called hurry sickness. Hurry sickness means that the clock in your brain, and that's how you measure time, by the way. You don't measure time walking around going like this. You have an internal clock in your brain that's saying how fast time is passing. And interacting with technology speeds that up. So you begin to feel like time's faster and faster and faster. I'm not gonna do this exercise with you, but I've done it with groups where I'll say, close your eyes and without counting, estimate the passage of one minute. When you think the minute is up, raise your hand and open your eyes and I'll time you, okay? The downside uh, record I have on that is nine seconds. Okay, so feel, what's it like going through life when your brain's telling you a minute's passing every nine seconds? I mean, you're moving, okay? So what we know from the studies is most, and by the way, most people come in at about 30 seconds, 35, and usually if you get all the way to a minute, they're asleep, okay? So <laughs> people are really moving. A Harvard study just came out last year that showed we are distracted 47% of the time, meaning we're not here mentally. So the next time you go to lunch with somebody or maybe a prospective donor or whatever, there's a 50-50 chance that their body, while being there, is no longer occupied by their mind. Their mind is someplace else. And so this is a really significant problem because it makes us dumber. We make more mistakes, we screw up things, and that's the nature of that beast. The other thing about hurry sickness, by the way, in case you think hurry sickness is one of these made-up syndromes, um, you know, just get out on one of the interstates around here and get in the left lane and go the speed limit. You know? <laughs> You'll see a lot of hurry sickness in your rear view mirror, among other things. Actually, don't do that, it's, it's dangerous. But here's what we know about hurrying. It's highly correlated with anger. When we hurry, we're primed to get angry. So the guy cuts you off, or you plan to go to the movie and get there just in time and there's a line, or whatever the case may be that gets people angry, okay? So just be aware of that as well. I'm gonna show you another short video that kinda drives home the challenge that we have to being both mindful and emotionally intelligent, both of which, again, require each other. Um, and it talks a little bit about the impact of technology on the human brain. So let's take a quick look at this. So you're reading an article online when you get an instant message with a link to a funny photo, which of course you have to share. And now you're reading your Facebook news wall, which sends you to a video of a panda bear attacking a kid. And now you're reading Wikipedia to learn everything you can about the violent behavior of panda bears. And this is what three minutes on the internet can be like. We live like this all the time, and it has to have some kind of effect on us. The net is making us more superficial as thinkers. That is Nicholas Carr. He is the author of The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. To understand this whole thing better, we need to go way back in time to say, like, the prehistoric age. You wanted to know everything going on around you because the more you knew about your surroundings, the less likely you were to get attacked by a predator. And there's even evidence that our brains release some dopamine, pleasure-producing uh, neurotransmitter chemical, to reward us for seeking out and finding new information. <laughs> so getting distracted felt good and helped us stay alive. But the problem is that nowadays, predators aren't much of an issue, but we still have the same brains. And also, there's the internet, which is 
it's an incredibly information rich environment uh, that the net creates for us. And that's why we use it so much. I, I mean, sounds, pictures, words, text. And what this tends to do is, is promote a sort of compulsive behavior, in which we're constantly checking our smartphone, constantly glancing at our email inbox. We're kind of living in this perpetual state of distraction and interruption. Which is dangerous because that mode of thinking crowds out the more contemplative, calmer modes of thinking. And that focused, calm thinking is actually how we learn. It's a process called memory consolidation. And that means the transfer of information from our short-term working memory to our long-term memory. And it's through moving information from your working memory to your long-term memory that you create connections between that information and everything else you know. So you've got this awesome life-changing piece of information in your short-term memory, but then you hear that email ding and poof, there it goes. That email takes its place and you never get a chance to learn anything, all because of one distraction. So attention is the key, and if we lose control of our attention or are constantly dividing our attention, uh, then we don't really enjoy that consolidation process. But I can hear it now. Someone out there is saying, uh, what does learning matter if all the information in the world is just a Google search away? Well, um, that is kind of shortchanging our intellects. If that's the way you're using your mind, just kind of searching very quickly and finding information and then forgetting it very quickly, you're never building knowledge. You're simply, you're, you're kind of thinking like a computer. Which means that our very humanity is at stake. And it would be a shame if we all got assimilated because, well, humanity is pretty neat. I really believe that if you look at the great monuments of, of culture, they come from people who are able to pay attention, who control their mind. That's what allows us to think in the highest terms, in, in, think conceptually, think critically, uh, think in some very creative ways. And it's this kind of thinking that's at risk, being eroded one cute cat video at a time. Don't get us wrong, the internet is good for lots of things and it should be celebrated. But the best thing we can do for our minds is to find some time every day to unplug calm down, and focus on one thing at a time. Your email and those cats will be here when you get back. So the result of all of this is that people today are much more prone to emotional hijacking, okay? They're more emotionally reactive because they're hurrying all the time and they're distracted much of the time. You may call it multitasking. I call it multi-distracting. In fact, people cannot do more than one thing at a time, but they can rapidly move from tasks back and forth, and that's multi-distracting, and that's what makes us particularly vulnerable to this. And obviously, if you get hijacked, you're no longer in charge of you, okay? When we look at the brain, when somebody gets triggered, it happens in 50 milliseconds, virtually instantaneous. And as soon as you're triggered, the emotional response kicks in and then the behavioral response kicks in right after that. So mindfulness is a way to push back against these challenges, regain control of our own internal processes, meaning what we think, where we put our consciousness, how we respond rather than react emotionally and so on and so forth. And you've heard this over and over, but that doesn't make it any less true. Breathing is a key element of this process. When we look at people when they're emotionally hijacked or stressed or thinking ahead or thinking back as opposed to being here now, they're almost holding their breath. They do what we call stutter breathing. They're going <laughs> like this. And so you can literally modify your consciousness, the way your mind's working, by altering your breathing. But don't believe it for me. I'm gonna show you another quick video. I know I'm overwhelming you with videos, but I'll stop soon unless you'd like me to go on. When I was in grade school, this is really dating me. We still had reel-to-reel -reel, you know, movie projectors kind of thing. And you'd walk into the room. I went to what George Carlin called a Catholic prison school. And when you, it was really an okay place. But you walk into the room, elementary school, and you'd see the projector there and you'd go, oh, thank God. You know, I mean, I mean, literally, thank God. Because, you know, you knew that you wouldn't have to listen to the nun all day. So anyway, I'm gonna show you another quick video about kids 
talking about emotional self-regulation. Here we go. I get really mad when my brother hits me a lot. I don't like it when you say you don't want to play with me. When I'm mad, my brain can get a headache and it can start hurting. Your blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, mad just takes over your body. I just get out of control. It's kind of like if you had a jar and then the jar would be your brain and then you put glitter in the jar and that would be how you would feel. Like if you shook up the jar and the glitter went everywhere, that would be how your mind looks. And it's like spinning around and then you don't have any time to think. And you sometimes punch stuff and people when you don't really mean it. When I get angry, I feel it in my heart. I really don't like when I get angry. The amygdala really reacts, but the prefrontal cortex tries to keep it down. When I like feel like I wanna, you know, get really angry and yeah, I just like sometimes, you know, like take deep breaths. Like first you find a place where you can be alone. Then you find some way to relax and calm down. When I need to calm down, I take deep breaths. I breathe in through my nose. Sometimes I close my eyes or just take deep breaths. Like it's coming down, it's like not like moving. It's like slowing down and then it stops. And the heart plumps slow and then it goes into your brain. It's like all the sparkles are at the bottom of your brain. My brain like slows down and then like I feel more calm and then I'm like ready to speak to the that person. So the method that was studied at the center again in the neuroscience proved it, the one I had you do right at the beginning called the brain reboot, that really works. I'll give you an example of how well it works. I was asked to come into a home healthcare and hospice group working with a, a large healthcare organization in Wisconsin, which is where I hail from. And um, their home healthcare and hospice folks, you know, they go into the homes and they do checkups with people and help them take, you know, their meds and so on and so forth. And of course, the hospice people are dealing with folks who are facing their passage. And overall, what they were experiencing was really, really low patient satisfaction scores. They used a measure called press gainy, and they were like below the 20th percentile. So they were in trouble. And when we went in and sort of diagnosed what was going on, it was mostly this stuff I've been talking about. Distracted, hurrying, overwhelmed with inputs, that sort of stuff. So when they asked what should we do about this, I said, let's just teach folks how to do this breathing method, this mindful moment brain reboot method. And when they go, before they go in to see somebody, they drive up to the home or whatever, spend a minute in the car doing this, go in, see the person, when you come out, spend a minute in the car doing it again before you go in and see the next person and so on and so forth. And in six, this is all they did, and in six months their press gainy scores went up over the 80th percentile. Why? Simply because the people that they were interacting with felt at a deep level their presence. Oh, you're here, you're not distracted, you're with me, we're connected. That's the power of it. 
and folks that you work with, whether they're colleagues or prospective donors or current donors or whatever, they're gonna have that same experience. If you're not present, they're gonna sense it. They may not be able to articulate it, they may not be consciously aware of it, but they'll know it, they'll feel it, and they'll react to that feeling. So this method really works. We've tested it in the lab over and over again. It's quick, it's easy, you can do it anywhere. And if you're like me, when you get home from a day of work and you pull into the driveway, you sit in your car and do this for five minutes before you go in the house. You know? So this is what it creates, an internal locus of control, this capacity to be in charge of you rather than having the environment be in charge of you. Now this is contextual. You know, there are situations where I have an external locus of control just because of who I'm with or what's going on, times when I have an internal. I want to have more of the latter. I want to be more of that in charge mode than anything else because fundamentally, if you're not in charge of yourself, then your environment is. Mindfulness and meditation and EI help you to get there. You know, if you spend all your time in an external locus, then you are being you know, yanked around by the chain of your experiences, so to speak. What's the saying? Uh, it, it's okay to visit Pity City, just don't move there, okay? So we all go to external locus of control once in a while, that's just being human, but don't hang out there any longer than is necessary. So the brain reboot is this method. Very quick and easy to do, can be done anywhere, anytime. I've done it sitting with people and during a conversation, in meetings. The teams that I've run when I was at Empathia, we always started our team meetings with this method together. We wanted to offload all that emotional residue we were bringing into the room from our prior interactions with people and be clear and present with each other. We did it at the end of the meetings to clear the cash, so to speak, so that whatever we're going to next we could be present and engaged with as well. So the method is simple and it works and it deals with this thing called emotional spillover. If you don't offload this emotionality, by the end of the day, you're gonna be just you know, like Atlas carrying around all this emotional stuff. Uh, it's called baggage, right? That reminds me, I was going through the Milwaukee airport a while ago, I was actually on my way on a backpacking trip um, and so I had a ton of gear. I mean, I had a rolling duffel and I had this other suitcase and I had a pack on and I'm just like clawing my way through the airport towards the gate. And this gentleman, this older gentleman was coming the other way had nothing in his hands at all. And we came kind of up to each other and he said, stop. So I did. And he says, do you know what the Latin word is for baggage? Well, I took four years of Latin, but he had me, you know. Um, I said, no, what's the Latin word for baggage? And he said, impedimenta, have a nice day. And he walked away. So, <laughs> so, but he's right, it's an impediment. And if you don't offload it, it weighs you down, it takes charge of you, and you lose that internal locus of control. It basically just disappears. So the mindful moment approach is a great way to do it. So let's bring this home a little bit. I want you to try something, if you would at your tables, I want you to ask yourself a question. Identify in your own mind one of your hot buttons. What's something that when somebody says, does, whatever, it really sets you off, okay? And then once you've identified whatever that hot button scenario is, ask yourself this question. How do you react on the inside? What's your emotional response on the inside? And what behavior does that create on the outside? Meaning, what are you feeling privately within yourself, but what do people around you during those moments happen to see through your behavior? It may not be much. You may be one of these, I'm just gonna hold on to my stuff kind of people, or you may be ah, out there, you know, but how do you react? So if you would take a moment, identify a hot button, identify how you react, and then I'm gonna do this fairly quick, but turn to one of your neighbors, if you would, and do the self-disclosure, true confessions thing, and tell them, you know, tell them what it is, because I'm gonna take you to something else related to this next. So take a couple of minutes, if you would, to do that, please. What's your hot button, and how does it affect you?
One more minute, please. One more minute. Okay, if we could come back together. Sorry, I know you're having a lot more fun talking to each other. You know what I've always noticed about this uh, this exercise, when I ask people to do it, a lot of times, you know, being groups, you ask people to do an exercise, and like you'll say, Did you do this? And there's like this pause, and people are kind of going, What are we supposed to? You know, when you ask them about hot buttons, they're just right into it. <laughs> I get it, okay? So we all have them, and again, I would, would again remind you to think about whatever that situation was that you came up with, even if you didn't get a chance to share it all. It, it probably was something that pushed against the core value that you have. Enjoyed, we were talking about this and the core value in your situation and you know, really appreciated your remark about the serenity prayer afterwards, but that was great. It's a private joke. So when you get activated, when you get triggered, these are the things the science tells us help you to downregulate that. The mindful moment or brain reboot is primary. Power posing is another one. How many of you heard of power posing? somewhat controversial in my field, but power posing is basically the Wonder Woman pose, okay? And so when you get in the Wonder Woman pose, the interesting thing we see that happens in the brain is that primary stress hormones go down, cortisol, adrenaline, up and up and so on, and um, confidence uh, hormones go up. That would be testosterone. D don't get excited, guys. Um, it, it's really a temporary thing, okay? So, and then there's brief meditation, that helps with this. Going outside, the data shows us that if you get upset and you go outside in five minutes, we'll see a serotonin uptick in the brain. Serotonin is a feel good chemical that's antidepressants are supposed to increase in the brain. Some do, some don't. Music, and then micro exercise. Anger is a physical experience. It's bound up in your physiology, so you can discharge it through your physiology. So you see Michelle Obama there doing 20, and, and I think that this is just representative of the fact that you can use methods to downregulate when you get hijacked. But if you're mindful and you have high EI, you're not going to get hijacked as much. It's just simply not going to occur. You're going to get this capacity where when something stimulates you, that trigger hits. Instead of just reacting, there's a temporal pause. We can actually see this in the brain. There's a temporal pause where you're able to go, okay, I'm activated. That's probably not what you're saying, but what am I gonna, how do I wanna respond as opposed to just being, you know, somebody hits your knee and you, <clears throat> you have that knee jerk kind of response. So that's the important element here. The second element of mindfulness is what we call active practice. And again, that's just doing the things you already do by using your senses to stay connected with the present experience and not letting your mind go off to whatever. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but you can Google it, as they say. Here's what we see in the mindful brain. After a 10 minute meditation over there on the left, that's the before, obviously. This is a right-handed person because the left hemisphere is lit up. And that's monkey mind, that's what you're looking at. And that's after 10 minutes of meditation, the brain is basically, now remember, once you meditate for six to eight weeks on a daily basis, this becomes your new default mode. Here's your default mode, not that one. So you're there more often than not. Okay, and I put the cat up there because any of you know who Eckhart Tolle is? He wrote The Power of Now and that sort of thing. 
he said he'd met six Zen masters in his life. They were all cats. Okay, so um, those of you that have them probably could agree with that. And then finally, meditation is the most powerful and rapid way to get there. Again, it's not the only way. So I want to show you, again, a very quick little video from Dan Harris about meditation, sort of meditation 101, because a lot of people say, okay, that's great. How do you do it? Despite what you may have heard, meditation does not involve joining a group, paying any fees, wearing any special outfits, sitting in a funny position, or believing in anything in particular. It is simple, secular, scientifically validated exercise for your brain. You don't have to do it yet, but just so you know, here are the three steps. One, sit with your back straight and your eyes closed. Two, notice the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. Pick a spot where it's most prominent. Usually that's your nose or your chest or your belly. And just focus your full attention on the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. Now, as soon as you try to do this, your mind's going to go nuts. You're going to start thinking about, what am I going to have for lunch? Why did I say that dumb thing to my boss? Your brain's going to go nuts, and that's fine. The whole game is to notice when you've gotten lost and to start over. And then to start over again and again and again. Every time you do that, it's like a bicep curl for your brain. And it shows up on the brain scan. Scientists have found this in the lab. It's also, by the way, a radical act. You are breaking a lifetime's habit of walking around in a fog of projection and rumination, and you're actually focusing on what's happening right now. Meditation is unlike anything you do in the rest of your life. Failure is actually success. As I said, the whole game is just trying, failing, starting again, failing, starting again. Here's my advice. You should be meditating every day, five to 10 minutes a day. That's it. This doesn't require some giant investment. I don't care how busy you are. You have five to 10 minutes to give this a shot. I guarantee you it will make a big difference. The most common myth about meditation is that when you do it, your mind goes blank. It clears. And that if you have thoughts, you're screwing it up. You're doing it wrong. It's not true at all. You must be distracted to learn how to meditate. Distract, refocus, distract, refocus, distract, refocus. That's the bicep curl for the brain. And it trains your brain that whenever it does get distracted by the environment to refocus on the here and the now. So that's the power in it. I'm going to jump over this slide real quick um, and show you some resources for a minute. By the way, if any of you are a little bit like me or a little OCD, then it probably bothers you when I jump over slides. I actually got that on an evaluation once where somebody said, if you're not going to use the slide, don't put it into the pump. So <laughs> if it bothers you, I'm sorry. You're kind of like me. But here's some apps that really are, are helpful. Actually, the most popular app, the most used app is Insight Timer. Um, the one that's most subscribed to is Headspace, but it's not used as much as Insight Timer. Don't ask me why. But these are really good if you want to self-teach. Uh, those are good websites, and their classes usually in most local areas. In the Milwaukee school system and Madison school systems right now, they're teaching meditation to kids in elementary school. And what they're seeing from doing that is that the kids are, their academic scores are improved, their behavior is better, their collegiality, if you want to call it that, with other kids is better, and so on and so forth. So it's a worthwhile thing to learn. So social awareness is that third element of EI, and it's basically empathy, right? So it's capacity to understand and be empathic with other people, kind of read their feelings and respond appropriately to those feelings. And we know that empathy is really comes into these three types. I love this quote from Teddy Roosevelt, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's really true in your business, I would think, exclusively, that they need to know that you also are caring a person, that you care about them. Then they're interested in what you have to say. Until you get there, it's very difficult to have an open mind on the other end of the conversation. Empathy comes in three varieties. Cognitive, which is, gee, there's really nothing in my experience that I can relate directly to what this other person's gone through, but at least intellectually, I get it. I understand why they feel that way. Emotional is when there's something inside of you that connects with their pain or their suffering or their issue, whatever that case may be, 
at which point it's pretty easy to empathize because you've been there. And intuitive is knowing how to respond to the person in an effective way in order to uh, obviously create that connection. So I'm debating whether to show you this next video. I don't think I have time for it. I'm hurry sick. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll show you. This is a little video about empathy, since you asked. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. (laughs) Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed, and then we look and we say, hey, and you climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. (laughs) I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So empathy is core, it's a key element. And if you look at leadership styles, even command and control leadership styles work if the leader has empathy for the folks that they are commanding and controlling. So it's a real critical element in connecting with people. And connecting with people is what you do. So finally, there's relationship management. That's sort of where you take those three other elements, self-awareness, self-regulation, emotion, or excuse me, social awareness, and mindfulness. Throw them all into the pot, mix it up, and you're supposed to come out with this, which is how to remain mindfully engaged with people. I put on your tables, or had the, the kind folks here put on your tables, a thing called common transactional flaws. This is from Marshall Goldsmith, who wrote What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And these common transactional flaws are things, and we're not going to do this exercise because I'm hurry sick right now, okay? But I'd encourage you, if you work with a team, to do this exercise with your team, is to go in, give people this list, and ask them to circle the top three that they see happening most often in your work environment. And then, when they're done sort of assessing everybody else, then have them circle the top three that they think they do most often themselves. And what you'll usually have happen in that discussion is you'll uncover these little transactional flaws that tend to screw up empathy by creating more emotional danger as opposed to emotional safety. And you'll get a better sense for how your team can improve its style. If these are comments that you tend to make when you're out, say, doing a donor visit or whatever, I'd strongly encourage you to you know, cease and desist, okay? Because these things create a sense in the other person that you don't get them, that you don't have empathy for their situation, and that fundamentally you're not an emotionally safe person to talk to. 
So that's why this is really important to things not to do as opposed to this. Skipping over that. Last thing, the key element is rapport. Rapport is a condition in which the people who are relating to each other feel like they have a mutual understanding and mutual respect. That doesn't mean they necessarily like each other. They may even have disputes around what to do or how to do something, but they respect each other and they get each other. That's what rapport is, okay? And we know from the science that word choice only accounts for 7% of the rapport effect. So I just gave you word choices. That's the 7%, okay, that can screw it up. But fundamentally, most communication at emotional level, and that's how people make decisions, is with their feelings more than their heads, okay? Most communication operates subliminally. In fact, over 95% of the cognitive processing that goes on in the brain it never reaches conscious awareness. Okay, you, we can even show that when you say, I've made a decision, your subconscious made it some time ago and you're just finding out now, okay? So the subconscious is very powerful and it is the place where you got to go to get rapport with another person. And the way you get it is through a process we, which many of you probably already know called pacing. How many of you know pacing? Okay, well, I take that back. So, um, <laughs> Pacing is a, is a process that's a lot like ballroom dancing, okay? You get out on the floor with another person, who's gonna lead? They're gonna lead, you follow, okay? And what are you following? You're following the, vocal, the, excuse me, the vocal qualities they display and what is generally referred to as body language. That's 93% of the rapport effect right then and there. So when you pace somebody, you first observe them What's their posture like? What kind of gestures do they tend to use? If you've been watching me, you already know mine. What sort of facial expressions tend to show up? And when you listen to their voice, what's the tone, the tempo, the volume of their speech? It doesn't take long to figure this out when you're with somebody. And once you are, then you begin to approximate those behaviors and feed those back to them. In other words, you're doing this kind of interpersonal dance and they're leading and you're following. Don't be stepping on their feet, okay? So if you're with somebody who talks really loud like fast like this, and you tend to talk kind of slow and low like that, then you want to bring your volume up. You don't have to go all the way up to where they, but you want to bring it up a little bit higher and get closer to them, and you want to talk a little bit faster than you might otherwise and get closer to them because you're synchronizing your sets of behaviors to create rapport. When I was at Michigan State teaching in the family practice residency, we used to try to teach the doctors how to develop rapport with their patients by telling them to use the right words. And it was an abysmal failure. The course was called Social Context of Medicine and their students referred to it as scum. Okay, so um, what we did was we videotaped them with their consent doing the interview with their patient and then we would do an exit interview, ask the patient was there rapport, wasn't there rapport, and so on and so forth. And what we found out is if the doctor kind of did the dance with the patient, rapport went way up. But if they were out of sync and dancing like we did in the 60s, then rapport went way down. Okay, so this is the key to developing that capacity with other people is to use rapport. Remember the guy from UC Berkeley talking about mirror neurons in the brain? That's what gets lit up when people subliminally sense that you're in sync with them and that you're sort of doing this very well-coordinated dance together vocally and non-verbally as it were. And if you don't buy that, that this is innate in human beings, here's a video to prove otherwise. You get the idea, okay? So, I mean, as far as we can tell, it's gibberish, you know, the 7% word choice thing isn't really operating here. But the rest of it is, they're in sync, okay? And that sync creates this sense of rapport. You know, adults, they kind of think, oh, well, that's just kid. 
you can do this. And so if you're with somebody and you feel like the rapport isn't present or it's you know, fading away for whatever reason, as opposed to saying just the right words, it's more important to get yourself into sync with this other person through the pacing process. So being mindfully present with that individual is a key to relationship management. Pacing body language and vocal qualities, which by the way, you wanna practice when it doesn't really matter. So practice it on people where it doesn't matter first, so you get the hang of it, and then you can do it with people where it does matter. Like the vocal pacing thing I always do, did with telemarketers, <laughs> because that's all you got is the vocalization. You know, and they get on, how are you, Mr. Chart? I, I wonder if you would be interested in an offer we have this evening. Well, thank you very much for calling me. I appreciate you interrupting my dinner. And uh, no, I'm not interested, but we had rapport, okay? So, um, <laughs> Other presenters have talked about the importance of asking questions, very important as part of this relationship management. Listening when you actually ask, mirroring their vocabulary, don't be a psychologist and use terms they can't understand. And of course, we all know about storytelling and the story processing, and that's kind of where I'm gonna wrap, is that storytelling, we all have one, it's called our life. And when you can ask questions and get people to tell you their story, you're half the way there to building rapport. Uh, we know that in storytelling imprints on the brain, you can remember stories and anecdotes and quotes your whole life and forget other things because they imprint, the emotionality imprints them on the brain. It's called an express lane to the heart and it really is how people make decisions. We're not logical beings. Uh, there's a real bonding when people share stories and uh, I always go into high, profile high impact discussions with some in my pocket. Uh, quotes, anecdotes, metaphors, things I know will connect with whatever the subject at hand may happen to be. So that's kind of my wrap and I'm sticking to it. And I wanna wrap up by just um, sharing a couple of quick things. Maybe you're looking at this and you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of stuff, and it is. One thing, that's all. You just need to pick out one thing from this that you're willing to take away experiment with in your own behavior and try it out and see how it works. But you've been given a lot of things today. I mean, the presentation you did earlier, I mean, it's just a ton of great stuff. And many of the presenters have given you really valuable information. So what do you take away? Well, if you're gonna take away one thing from this, I can tell you how to up the chances that it won't just you know, fade away and never get used. And that's the process of reminders. Now this may seem simple to you, but the studies show that when you use electronic reminders, they mostly don't work. We get, the brain gets habituated to them and it stops paying attention. Okay, so when these things are beeping and buzzing at you and everything, you know, I don't know about you, but when my phone says breathe, I go, you think I'm not, what, you know. So we kind of get irritated with them. When we put up our own post-it notes, old fashioned analog post-it notes, and put them up in places we know we're gonna look, and we have a message to ourselves on that note to learn, you know, meditate or be mindful or do the brain reboot, build rapport, pace, whatever it is. Put them up in places that 40% greater chance you're actually gonna do it than if you use electronic reminders. And here's the other thing that'll even amp that up more. It's called the question behavior effect. The science shows us that when people are trying to change behavior, they'll order themselves to do it. You will meditate today. And you know, when, if you're like me, when you do that, there's something that rises up inside of you and says, you can't tell me what to do, even if it's me telling myself. So does you get this resistance effect? The way to get around the resistance effect is the question behavior process. So instead of telling yourself to do something or ordering yourself, you ask yourself, will I do it? So in the morning you wake up, say, will I meditate today? Or maybe at night, just before you go to bed, which is a really good time to do it because your brain is more active when you're asleep than when you're awake, is to ask yourself, will I be mindful tomorrow? And what happens when you do that is that question drops down into the subconscious, which is again, the seat of most cognitive processing and decision making, and it will noodle on it and incubate on it, and the answer will appear in your behavior. It's not like your subconscious is gonna go say, okay, we're gonna meditate. You'll just find yourself, yeah, I wanna do this, and you'll start doing it. So use the question behavior effect that will help you to take some of these takeaways, not just from this presentation, but the others, and really build them in so that they don't just fade away as a one and done. 
Last but not least, the great and late Maya Angelou, people may forget what you said, may forget what you did, they'll never forget how you make them feel. And if you're present, you're empathic, you're mindful and engaged with people and showing that emotional intelligence, you will leave a lasting impression on them and they won't forget. Thanks very much for your attention. I hope it's been helpful. Sure, I can stay up here. Well, Philip, thank you so much for, uh, I don't know about you, but um, I feel more relaxed, more empowered. It's like, I call it listening to Steely Dan. You're 10% smarter just by doing it. So, um, <laughs> now I also want to thank you, obviously, for, for a wonderful presentation. And you should be aware that you allowed us to come full circle for all of our attendees. We had people come by land, by air, and by sea. He, he took a ferry across Lake Michigan to get here earlier today. So you made us come full circle. So thank you for a wonderful presentation. We have a, a special Michigan gift for you. Yum, yum. So let's give him a round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. All right, well, we are about to wrap up. I know it's been a, um, a power packed day of information and, and sharing. And like, unlike many conferences, we're done a little bit early. Most keep you here a little later, so we're going to wrap this up very quickly. I uh, certainly want to thank all of our sponsors, especially Northern Trust, uh, for making this possible. Uh, starting out uh, with just an incredible presentation uh, this morning by Ray Odom, talking about values and soulfulness, and then ending today with this wonderful presentation about how we can be more mindful. And other people might call these soft skills. I think I like to refer to them as power skills. These are going to make the difference in you personally, in your effectiveness as a professional, and just think of the impact it's gonna have in the organizations and the impact those organizations are now gonna have on the communities that we serve. So we like to provide technical, but also the complementary skills to go along with it. So we hope you appreciate kind of the wide spectrum of opportunities that we present to you today. Um, we hope you enjoyed it, the opportunity to gain knowledge, speakers in the community, um, Again, we strive to improve this conference every year, so if you have an evaluation form, please fill it out. We're gonna do a drawing for those gas cards, right, Lori? Yes, we are, okay. Finally, what day is development day next year? Anybody remember? <laughs> June 3rd, you guys are awesome. You know what, I think if we repeat the message, what, seven times, you get it. So we've gotta do those PSA ads four more times for them to get it, I think. All right. Um, if you would, if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member of the Plan Giving Roundtable. Again, we meet monthly. We have wonderful educational opportunities throughout the year. There's volunteer opportunities, mentor opportunities. It's an incredible value. So if you're interested, please see Lori. She'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, now, finally, um, I'm gonna, I started with a quote about the value of investing in education, and I'm going to end with a quote. I think that'll be a bookend to that. Um, it's from a gentleman by the name of Frank Herbert. It said, learning from books and example shows us that certain things can be done. Actual learning requires that you do those things. So I suggest we go out and learn by doing. So thank you again for attending. Please drive safely.